Um, today is very much about uh, celebrating success, and I, I want to do sort of a counterpoint and celebrate failure and errors and mistakes. And the first mistake I need to correct is that I'm in the Faculty of Science and Department of Psychology. Okay. <laughs> um, the title, Failing, Comma, Upwards, um, is taken from this idea that some people, particularly in politics, seem to be able to fail upwards. So we think of Chris failing, grayling, uh, and uh, Dido Harding are the two characters that come to mind. So I put a comma in there, I think that's important. I want to separate those two parts, that you can fail and still progress. So you can not succeed at things, your experiments can fail, your career can fail to a certain extent, um, but you can still go forward or upwards. Now the three things I'm going to talk about are survivorship bias, which I think is really important and far far too much underestimated, I think, in how we deal with data and looking at other people's careers and success and failure. Scientific excellence, which I think is a myth. And uh, social media, just what this thing, this new thing has done for us and what we could possibly uh, get out of it. And it's purely opinion, purely speculation. This may be offensive in some parts. I'll try and please just stop me or throw stuff. Feel free to throw stuff if it's uh, slightly too, too offensive. Here we go. Right. Uh, so hopefully this is the real mood over the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, hopefully now you're, you're quite happy. You've had some coffee, sort of a nice uh, sort of levity. I'm going to give you some thoughts and opinions which may, uh, may result in a decrease of mood. So by about half past 11, uh, you should be quite despairing about science and your careers. <laughs> But hopefully we'll, we'll bring it back, and so by the end of end of the session, and hopefully in the future as well, there'll be a bit more hope uh, that we can actually make all of our failures uh, slightly more productive. Survivorship bias, number one. Um, so who's seen this picture before? Anyone? Okay. Does anyone want to say what it shows? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, is it not the head of the plane gets shot? Yes, so this is, um, it's, a, it's a cartoon of, it's very similar, so it's basically the same thing. Um, so I think it's from the Second World War, it's from data, they were looking at planes probably flying back from continental Europe across the channel into the non-continental Europe of England, and they were um, looking at where the planes got damaged. Uh, you know, you look, look for all the holes, uh, and you see quite a lot in the wings, quite a lot in the middle of the fuselage, and then the tail seems to be almost useless, no, no point in having a tail. Um, and you can look at these data, these very salient bits of data, and you say, okay, what, what do we do with these data? Um, but the most important thing is the data you don't have, which is uh, the, the planes that didn't make it back. So the bits of the plane which don't have any data, there's no salient data points there, those are the important bits. So if you get uh, these are whole, these, you know, enemy. I mean, uh, fire has uh, created holes in your wing tips or your fuselage, that's kind of fine. Most or a large proportion of those planes can make it back. But if you suffer a hit in the engine or the nose or uh, the, the back, uh, it's pretty fatal. And those planes never make it back. So this is the data you don't have. The people who didn't make it, who failed, um, unfortunately. Uh, and it's extremely useful. So if you were going to design your research study, or a, you know, a next phase of plane design on this data, you would want to reinforce the parts of the plane where there's no data, because that's all you've got. The other ones made it back. So this is a, an analogy for your careers. Then. <laughs> uh, um, the people who made it, so people like me, uh, middle-aged, greying people, uh, they made it through. Uh, and so I'm going to tell you exactly how you should run your career by <laughs> telling you about all these, these wonderful, exciting data points that I have, right? The, the red dots. Um, and so the conclusion of this part of the talk then is don't listen to me or to senior people, essentially, because they've made it through and they won't necessarily be able to reflect the truth of the situation for all people at your stage. Uh, and I... <clears throat> When you're looking for, say, research money or to publish a paper, you can look for advice, and you definitely should look for advice. I'm not going to not going to say you shouldn't look for, say, research grant advice. But I've been to a number of these, um, say, research grant advice workshops, and they tend only to talk about successes. They can't really tell you about the grants that failed. Um, and 
and that's unfortunate. And I've asked the question explicitly as some of these things, and they just say, oh yeah, so we didn't look at the failures, we've only looked at the people who won grants, and this is what a successful grant looks like. The other half of the data, what do the grants that didn't succeed, what do they look like, and how different really are they? So I think that's a really critical question that I've never heard answered in my 20 years of trying to find you know, advice about getting grants, for example, and papers. Um, so if you can find that advice, and if you can go to a seminar later or uh, the um, RDS, which I've only just learned about today. <laughs> so yes. Here's a pile of lessons beyond how from panels where people haven't been successful. Yeah, excellent. So, we have so, that, yeah. yeah so, so seek it out. Look for the failures. Look for and try and distinguish what it was that made some success and some failures. Um, because often people won't tell you. So here is uh, I just googled this a week ago. This is completely biased and selective. I've just gone to. Um, Times Higher Education and asked, uh, just said, how, you know, Google how to win a research grant, and this thing popped up. And the THE is often um, selling us advice about uh, academia, um, but they've they've looked for advice about how to win a grant. And who who they've asked is the professor of structural biology, biology, the Redmond Barry Distinguished Professor Emerita, the research chair in systems biology, the professor of experimental physics, the distinguished professor of English, and the senior lecturer, just for good measure. Um, there's something common about these, these six people. They're extremely far progressed in their career. They've done extremely well. They're distinguished, they're retired, they're chairs. Um, what we don't have is anyone, say a tenuously employed postdoc who's giving us advice about how to get a grant or an overworked teaching assistant, how they break out of teaching assistant and get into research again. Or lecturers, you have to juggle workload and family. So what do these people help? Um, how can these people help you to get a grant? I don't know. I don't know the answer. And, and generally, you tend not to find this sort of advice. People tend to go to distinguished people who've made it, who've survived the plane journey back from occupied Europe. And, and <laughs> so that's just the point I want to make. There's plenty of advice out there. Just make sure you calibrate it and look for failures and successes. And people who maybe re reflect the realities of, of living in academia. I read, I'm reading a book by Armando Iannucci, my favourite uh, writer and producer, um, who mostly focuses on politics and into music a bit. But um, <clears throat> I read this just a couple of weeks ago and I thought it was fantastic. The sad truth is that we form our view of progress from a small list of brilliant genius, geniuses, successful military strategists, and absolutely lunatic demagogues. <laughs> what goes unaccounted for is the great majority of us, and I include myself, who were just okay being absolutely average, reasonably well behaved, and mostly just fine individuals who sort of got by. And I think that's fantastic. So the vast majority of us will not uh, be extremely successful in any in any particularly interesting way. <laughs> we'll all just get by and we'll have a nice time, hopefully. Uh, and that's absolutely fine. <laughs> and that's the message I have. You don't need to succeed in anyone, you know, in anyone's particular mind to have a nice time in science. Um, so yes, yeah, so every time you hear about success of any kind, just remember all the people who failed, who didn't get the award, or published the paper, or get the job. Or, um, so I just think apply your brilliant scientific minds or research minds to everything, to your career as well, and to advice. Just you know, get a good control group, design design your um, career study thoughts uh, carefully. Remember what kind of motivations people have to give you advice or to or to select bits of advice. So yeah, uh, be critical when you're getting career advice, just as you would if you're collecting data on your medical thing. I'm happy to take any questions at any time, by the way, or if anyone wants to stop me <laughs> if, I'm ran if I'm ranting, which I may be. You said before, um, yeah. yeah, I'm reminded of, a, of the American writer I guess I'm paraphrasing. Every time you hear about research success, a little bit of me dies. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it can be quite, it can be quite depressing um, hearing about success all the time. <laughs> okay, I'll move on to the next bit. Um, anyone know who these uh, chats are? Okay. 
Uh, no, there's no, no Bill Gates. These are the last four groups of winners of the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. <laughs> no? Okay, well, it's, it's, it's actually quite good that uh, you know, I'm recognising them. That's good. Um, so uh, they're, they're a very diverse bunch, um, as you can see. Um, so I'm just, I just said so when the public might think, when you say what, what is, you know, who are the best scientists? What's the, what, what is scientific excellence? They'll probably say something like, oh, you know, I don't know, Nobel Prizes, Einstein, you know, that's the kind of thing they'll say. Um, and and I'm, I'm not here to argue with Einstein or Nobel Prize winners. I simply want to say it's it's a very selective bunch of people, typically uh, old white men, if I can. <laughs> um, and the other thing I, I think is really interesting about the Nobel Prize, it's probably the most important uh, prize that the whole world knows about and the media go nuts for a week or so in, is it September, October that they came out? Um, and, uh, no, it's, when is it? <laughs> yeah, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> the point is, um, it's decided by a relatively, again, a relatively small selected bunch of people who happen to work in the Karolinska Institute in um, Stockholm, which is very nice, very nice place. Um, and, you know, they, they just decide, they have private processes and meetings and committee structures and whatever, and they decide who is going to get the million dollars this year, or the 10 million kroner this year. And they have an enormous amount of influence, but I've never, I, I looked through the names of the, the current committee, and I've, I'm not a physiologist or a medicine uh, doctor, so I, I wouldn't necessarily know them, but I didn't know any of them. They're just a bunch of guys, and they look perfectly nice. And, you know, <laughs> but it, this is how the, the biggest scientific prize is decided, you know, behind closed doors of a relatively small bunch of people in a particular institute in Sweden. It's the most, you know, it is the, sig the symbol of scientific excellence. So all I'm saying is just, you know, if you didn't win the Nobel Prize this year, that's not so bad. <laughs> It'd be nice to have the money, but uh, really it's just a couple of, well, relatively, a relatively small group of people's views that they've come to that year. And it's been very controversial historically. You have to be alive. It seems you have to be a relatively old person in your career to have, to have accumulated enough papers in nature and science to, to, one, to justify the award. So if, uh, if we're not just going to rely on people's opinions like, like me or the, the good folk of uh, Karolinska, how might we actually measure the quality of your, the excellence of your, of your research? Um, can we just rely on peer review? I think you know where I'm going with this. Um, and I'm sorry to say, in, in my vast experience of, I've probably reviewed, I think, 350 or so papers over the years and a few grants, and I've had my own papers reviewed plenty of times. And um, it's rather astonishing how, how much people, reviewers will disagree with each other. Um, but that's just an anecdote, and so we shouldn't rely on anecdotes. So we should instead, instead go to the wonderfully named Pia et al, 2018, in um, Post-Nature post and Science, uh, sorry, PNAS, the, um, the journal, and they um, did a study, a scientific study of peer review. So they took 25 real grant applications. I think they were all successful applications, which may, may be important, to NIH in America. They took 43 reviewers and they, in an experiment, and they reviewed um, all 25 grants. And they were looking for, can these 43 established academic reviewers agree on the ratings that they give to the 25 uh, established and successful academic grants. Um, we, we could take a poll here. <laughs> so the, the, I'm going to show you some graphs and I think positive on the on the chart is did the reviewers agree with each other? Negative will be did they disagree with each other? And in the middle just really random. You know where this is going. <laughs> So uh, the graph's a bit small, but um, well, I think it's, they're basically just correlations. I didn't actually read the paper, so I'm, I'm committing one of my own sins here. But um, one is positive correlation, minus one is negative correlation. So essentially on these nine scales for the preliminary rating, the strengths and the weaknesses, these 43 senior academics did not agree at all, were completely random with respect to these 25 funded applications. Now it may have been different if you took 25 funded and 25 unfunded, Maybe, you know, the, the t-test would have been significant. But I think it's remarkable that once you've got above the bar of grant award, if, if that even is a bar at all, that there was zero correlation. I mean, that's, that's really fascinating. Um, and I think just pick, just pick one study. I know there are more studies, and, but we don't, we don't take peer review as 
as a thing of study nearly enough. We just assume that the peer review process produces excellent science. And that's what the public think. A number of times they roll out, oh, it's peer reviewed, therefore it's good. It's peer reviewed, therefore it's science, blah, blah, blah. It's just, it just comes down to a couple of people's opinions. Don't, don't throw anything yet. <laughs> it really does. Um, and, and this, I think, brings it up. And, and I want to I want to look into this more and read, you know, read, read all the papers and maybe give a talk about it. But it's a pretty shocking graph. Um, the other thing was just a couple of weeks ago, again, I've been, since I uh, was invited to give the talk by Hannah, thank you very much, um, I've been collecting anecdotes online and this thing came out a couple of weeks ago by Brian Nosek. Anyone heard of Brian Nosek? Okay. Um, much more, much more well known in science, and, and sorry, in psychology and in social psychology. Brian Nosek is the, um, the current head and I think founder of the Open Science Framework, the o OSF, which you may have seen massive website as well as a sort of campaigning organization who are trying to make science more open and more better, more good. Um, anyway, he tweeted, look at this massive, uh, massive paper. And again, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't quite see that. I just taken screenshots of Twitter and anyway, these graphs here, what they did, they did um, another experiment. Now 534 reviewers looking at the same single paper. Um, I think it's a real paper by real authors and they, they've used the real authors names. Um, but they just um, reversed. I think there was a there was a the PI, the head the head author, the senior professor, and then the lowly postdoc or PhD student, and they they sort of switched the names around and said either this paper is by the the PI and the, the reviewers I think were in the field, so they kind of knew who it was, um, or they said this paper is by the the postdoc, um, or they gave I think neutral information. I haven't again I haven't read this one, <laughs> but I'm just retweeting it for you. Um, <laughs> And this graph on the right is the, the decision they came up with. So um, rejecting the paper is orange, uh, major revisions is sort of grey, minor revisions is light blue, and just accept straight out is, is darker blue there. Um, and if, if you were told that the first author was the postdoc, 65% uh, will reject. And if you were told that the first author was the senior professor, is that 23, 20, yeah, 23% of the project. And so it works in negatively and also positively. Only 2% of people accepted the postdoc's paper outright, whereas 21% accepted the, the PI's paper outright, um, which is pretty, pretty disturbing. I, it's the same paper, right? It's the same paper. Uh, there was there was a, a widely reported problem with the design is that the, uh, the PI had a sort of a uh, typical Caucasian name and the postdoc had a uh, a name of a, I can't remember which region of the world, but it was a non-Caucasian region name. Uh, and so there was also a sort of uh, location or geographic or language um, bias as well. Either way, it's not good. Um, and you probably find the same things for sex and um, field and who knows. So peer review is simply not a uh, objective process and you should not be upset if someone rejects your work <laughs> or your grant or your application for a job <laughs> because it's just a couple of people's opinion and we can't rely on peer review in general to distinguish the very best from the very worst and maybe you've all got PhDs and that's enough and you can all do good science and we should just say you know here are some opinions but it's not it's not actually a review of your excellence uh, I'm hoping we're Going to get past impact factor soon. It's only um, 67 years old now. Does anyone know that impact factor as a metric was 67 years old? <laughs> 1955. Uh, it was invented to uh, to help libra librarians choose which paper journals they wanted to put in their library because you know they've got limited space, limited money, and uh, which journals should I should I buy to put in my library? So impact factor is. From the 1950s, so before, you know, and most people had computers, just for the context. And it's just exactly the same calculation is still made from the one that Eugene Garfield made in <coughs> the 60s that he made the final. Anyway, my view of, of this, uh, given a whole talk about this, is that impact factor measures popularity only. <laughs> and, that, that, and that's, I don't think that's, um, it's not too controversial. Um, the problem is an awful lot of people, particularly journals themselves, um, 
um, particularly people who publish in journals with high impact um, factors, they will tend to use it as a measure of quality or of editorial procedure or whatever. I mean, and, and I would argue that no, none of that. It's purely popularity because that's how it's calculated. Anyway, I'm, I'm not going to, I've given a whole new other talk on that. And I don't want to stray, but I can definitely answer any questions about impact factor. Um, my favourite graph on impact factor is this one from Brain Sciences. And Tim Behrens, who is an extremely high impact scientist from Oxford, um, he's also a bit of an um, apple cart upsetter. But he um, did a little trick in, I think, 2016. He just took um, brain activation. He's a brain activation researcher. He's like written the software for brain activation and done the fundamental studies. And he's an extremely good, successful scientist. They just wrote a little program to uh, extract all the data from brain images uh, and correlate the data with the, the journal that they were published in. Uh, and in the red areas of this brain image are the, the areas of the brain that are reported in high impact journals. And in the blue are the areas that are reported in low impact journals. So um, if you know the brain very well, um, the most, the highest impact part of the brain is the fusiform face area, thanks to uh, Nancy Kamrusher and her very high impact um, friends and colleagues. Um, so if you study faces, face perception, you just you just tend to publish in high impact journals because your work is you know, excellent. Um, and also if you tend to study things like emotion or reward or um, uh, other things, then you, you tend to activate medial prefrontal parts of the brain. And the keywords associated, you did the same correlation with keywords, so which parts of the brain you activate and which keywords do you tend to use um, in high impact papers. And it's fear and emotion and reward and face perception. Uh, none of that is anything to do with quality, it's just which people tend to work in these areas, what do they tend to study, what, what journals tend to accept their work. And I would argue this is a purely social, cultural exchange of you know, preferences between, uh, between people. Uh, the reason I hate or love this uh, graph so much is that most of my work is on um, <laughs> touch I study the, the, I run the hand lab, so finger, tactile, so all things to do with touch and movement, this is my entire career, are current, negatively correlated with the impact factors, which is why it riles me up so much. <laughs> and if you care about, you know, the primary motor cortex or the supplementary uh, motor cortex or the primary sensory cortex, which this I do, um, then you are, you are deep blue on this graph and you are forever consigned to low impact journals. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would argue, as I did in this whole talk, and there's a link in there, um, it's just about popularity and really nothing else. And it's not just me who thinks this for decades and decades, academics have been criticising the impact factor and trying to get rid of it and giving talks like this and writing commentaries and doing reviews and doing meta science and coming up with new factors and it's still there because these massive corporations are still telling us still telling us this one number to three or four decimal places is your measure of quality. I say it's not. So we can't rely on peer review, although it's an extremely good thing and I, I definitely wouldn't get rid of it um, because it just you know, gives you comments from the people who are going to be reading your articles anyway, so best to get it before it's published. Um, and we can't, I, I think we should just consign impact factor to the, um, the past as soon as possible. But they don't help measure, measure scientific excellence in any way. And I am yet, and I would love someone to tell me what scientific excellence is, I am yet to hear what it is. So my, um, my thesis is that no one knows what scientific excellence is, or at least they're not willing to put in the graph required to give you any better answer than it's just a cultural myth. <laughs> Door is open, right? <laughs> so um, my advice then is uh, ignore the people who say we only fund excellent research and we only give prizes to excellent people. We only blah blah blah. Just do your best. Just um, read and think as much as you can. Get as much data as you're able to get in the in the limited time and resources that you have. Um, do as best as you can with the analysis. You know you can always do better. You can always try a different way. But just do your best and um, and try and communicate it as well as possible. And don't don't worry don't worry if you don't get into nature. It just doesn't matter. It really isn't. It really doesn't. I'm sorry. You, you may not get your Nobel Prize in 50 years when you're an old person, but uh, 
it just doesn't matter. What matters is people can read your work and think. That's it. Now I'm going to move on to the controversial parts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not running out of time. No, you're good. Uh, you're good? Cool. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, so here's a pretty little, pretty little bird representing social media. I only really know about Twitter. I don't use any, anything else. I have some Facebook accounts, but I got an email yesterday saying they've mostly been deactivated because I, I don't pump them full of personal information. So I'm only talking about Twitter, um, but I imagine it's pretty same same across all the other platforms. And what social media is telling you essentially is that you're inadequate. <laughs> so if you go on there, uh, you'll see people who succeed. And <laughs> Essentially, one message, one common message is that whatever you've done, it's probably not good enough. And uh, and here are all the people who've succeeded. And, and so my advice then would be, um, yes, it's out there, it's massive. There are huge companies feeding you, pumping you full of information about science and success. And just try and, <coughs> as far as possible, possibly, be dispassionate. Do not give a flying um, of about it as much as possible. So use it if you can, but don't. Uh, don't get too involved. I've seen young career, early career researchers have like nervous breakdowns because they're um, at least online they've had nervous breakdowns. I haven't actually met them, but um, people who've just had terrible times, they, their paper's been criticised online and they've spent the next three days just in this um, doom scrolling and uh, rabbit hole of, of trying to re respond to all the comments and, and they've just, yeah, it's not good. So um, I think it is good. Um, in my experience is that uh, so I've actually published a paper that came from Twitter. So there was just um, people were talking about stuff and I chipped in and um, they said, oh, we need to write a paper about this. And then I chipped into that. And it was a very easy way to find stuff, maybe comment, maybe get involved. And then I got a paper out of it for almost no work, which is, <laughs> which is wonderful. Um, it was on statistics, if anyone wants to know. <laughs> so it, it can be very good, Twitter especially for just making connections and um, breaking barriers is really good so at a conference or something like today you might not feel able to go and talk to the senior senior professor in the room but you could comment on their tweet or like it or retweet it uh, and that sort of breaks down the barriers between junior and senior and i think that's good or between people in um i don't know australia or africa or south america or europe who are sharing stuff which they never would otherwise be able to do. I think that's amazing that we've never had this in science, this instant ability to, to share is impressive. And you can use it for science news, you know, just to get a very rough opinion about what's happening. Um, some journals will use it, some newspapers will use it, some researchers will use it, but um, it's just one source of science news. Um, and you can sort of learn some things extremely superficially because of the limits. Um, but I've definitely learned things by browsing occasionally, um, learned new things and opened up new areas of thinking, which is good. The, uh, the cons are that it can be an utter cesspit. And there are people on there who are trolls, science trolls. There are people who will try and put a number to your career. I've had people sending me, here's your number. You've done very well, well done, what's that? You know, I know why are you giving me a number? <laughs> <laughs> there was someone a, about a year and a half ago who created a leaderboard of scientists and they sort of, they called it an audit. And they said, anyone hear about this? Oh, that's just a point. This, this guy somewhere, he didn't have a grant at the moment, created a leaderboard. He sent um, sort of requirements to all these researchers randomly selected to say, I'm audit auditing your work to produce this leaderboard. And they felt compelled because he said, I'm going to reveal your names on Twitter and give you a ranking. Um, it, was, it was appalling. Um, so social media can be very obviously very limited, so you can't um, give your whole opinion about things. You just have to uh, shorten it. Um, it will make you feel inferior at various times. And <laughs> just be aware of that. Don't go in there. And there's no college you can do a bit like um, well, press releases from universities or um, the Daily Mail science or Lots of other sources. There is no quality control here. You know, someone says like someone's making statements about scientific results on Twitter. Uh, has absolutely no quality. I don't think I need to tell you this. I think this is pretty straightforward. So I would say can be great. Can definitely be a, a benefit to your career and maybe getting your work out there in different ways. But um, can be another who hole. Anyone who doesn't um, know. 
the word cesspit. It's a big hole full of poo. <laughs> um, and um, the last couple of years have been extraordinary. So COVID, we all survived, I hope, and relatively intact. Um, and uh, the scientific disinformation that's out there, I mean, you must you must know this. This is it's just, I mean, it's appalling, and it sort of can't really think how to how to say it any any other way. So Toby Young is an appalling person, I think, and he he regularly you know retweets information about ivermectin. And in this one, I saw again a couple of weeks ago. There's a study that says it's 100% effective. Ivermectin is going to you know, cure all COVID. Why, why aren't we talking about this? Why aren't we doing this? And he, that's just his job to cause people to be upset. And it's got 20,000 likes at the time I took the screenshot. Um, and there's this other guy, sort of a, a counter, the counterpoint to this. It's called Health Nerd Gideon, and he spends I spend all his time on Twitter counteracting this all this um, stuff. And he's read it and he's done systematic reviews. And he just said the reason it's not being taken up is it's not very good. Um, so he's done the sort of peer review and he wrote a thread about why it's not very good. But essentially, social media is this appalling place where anyone can just say anything uh, with no quality control and they'll get 20,000 likes. You know, it's just snake oil. They're just selling snake oil like the old days when we used to go around with a crate and <laughs> in The Simpsons and Abraham Sim Simpson was selling this hair restorer stuff. It, it's just snake oil. So. Um, there are these people on, online and they must have real jobs as well, but they, they are just tireless and they spend all their time counteracting these fake these fake news. And I just I just find it hard to hard to comprehend really how they do this. And, and I think it must be, and they, they talk about it occasionally, it must be extremely depressing and exhausting. Um, so I would advise you if you if you're thinking of trying to counteract fake information online, um, maybe don't, maybe just I don't know. I'm, I'm really at a lot. I think we're, you know, the world is suffering from this at the moment. And I, I maybe just stay out of it for a while. You concentrate on your work. Um, <clears throat> the reason I'm here today, the selection bias that brought me here today, is that um, I think Hannah saw this or saw some of the consequences of this. So 18 months ago, at the start of COVID, we were all locked down. My wife was away on work. Um, and uh, I was it's Good Friday, Easter. I was rather, rather she wasn't away, but I was. She was. Um, and so I had the evening to myself, and I thought I would. I was sort of wondering, in a sort of crazy religious way, um, what if I died from COVID, and what you know, what's left of my scientific career? Is there anything I could do to improve the record a little bit? And so I thought, oh, what if I just say, oh, okay, I'll just, just. Just the, the, the niggling thoughts that I've always had about my papers, you know, for 20 years, they haven't, put, haven't written down anywhere. I'll just, I'll put one thing per paper. And I did that. And if you want to read about it, I was trying to find a link to it, but I didn't put it in. Um, it's in there and I had 60 or so tweets. And each one is on one per paper. And I say, oh, in this one, the control group is rubbish. Or uh, we didn't do the stats right in that one. Or this one, I didn't even read. You know, I didn't even, <laughs> I hardly even knew the co -author. No, I've read, I've read, <laughs> I read them all. There's some that I, you know, hardly even worked on. on the so I just gave a little bit of context to all my own work. I didn't consult any of my co-authors. I just sort of did it uh, just to say, sort of, you know, clear the clear the deck. Um, and it turned out to be my most liked and shared set of tweets. And it led to me, my little old me, publishing a little one page in Nature. It hasn't, <laughs> hasn't been cited. <laughs> and uh, it's just me saying you can use social media to correct your, you know, to, um, what's the word? Confess to your sins. Um, uh, but working with nature was it's not fun. <laughs> There's like three levels of editing, just for you know, 400 words, whatever it was. And I had to just go back and forth. That's that's not what I'm saying. That is what I'm saying. Like it took me a day to write the thing, and then like at least half a day to correct the the edits that were forced into my mouth. So I wasn't happy with the final thing, but anyway. So yeah, um, so it was it was fun to do. Led to very and what I, I think the most interesting thing about it was that lots of people were saying, "Oh, this is really brave. Oh, we never see this." And I, I that's really weird. Like, why is no one saying in public what they could do better or what they've done wrong? And we have this sort of really weird obsession with everything just being perfect, and it's just not. Um, and so there's four international media interviews and this presentation, which is fantastic. <laughs> so in, in the end, it was a confession, but it was really a self-serving confession because it's actually done, done me very well, I think. Um, I, 
the, perhaps the funniest thing, Frontiers, the journal, I had a couple of papers in Frontiers, and they wrote to me to say, we're now concerned about your papers. <laughs> 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 We've read your tweet. Would you like to retract your, because I put the DOI. Would you, like, would you like to retract your article? I said, no, I'm fine. I'm just, <laughs> just discussing, like, if I hadn't put this on social media, I would still have these thoughts. Like you wouldn't be writing to me. So the, the selection bias for Frontiers was that you've, you've said something about your articles, therefore we need to hunt you down nuts. And I, I told them that. Uh, <clears throat> so just a bit of context. Um, what, where have I been? Just in case you want to ask me about, I don't know, how this affected my career. Um, I did, how old I am. Um, I've had a few years out, did a degree in psychology and neuroscience, then an MSc and PhD in neuroscience, went to France for a couple of years, went to Jerusalem for a couple of years, uh, first job in lecture in Reading, then I came to Nottingham in 2015, nearly eight years ago. Uh, so that's the that's the sort of bland career progress, but I'm going to put failures and, and successes along the way, important failures. So I think my first, first thing I sort of applied for I think I applied for three or four things and one one worked out, so I went with that one. Um, my first paper came, I think, towards the end of my PhD, but um, then ramped up a fair bit. I've been publishing fairly consistently since then. Uh, then my second postdoc, it was kind of a guaranteed sort of position because it was a fellowship for international international researchers coming into Jerusalem and very few people wanted to go so it was kind of I was almost almost guaranteed that I did apply for something else that rejected uh, my first job three rejected applications I think I can't remember um, I, my first PhD student started in 2010 I think and she finished 2013 my only large grant came when I was in Reading um, and I thought on the basis of these wonderful successes, I thought I'd apply for a promotion and they said, no, not yet. <laughs> so uh, I decided to move because that's what happens when you apply for a promotion. <laughs> and I came here and then I think I applied for three or four jobs again when I came here, two rejected, one successful. Uh, since I've been here, many, many things have been rejected. I think there's been a bit of a downturn in success rates for grant applications, but I haven't had a big successful grant since I've been here. Uh, and this, I think I'm going to promote as success failure cycle. Uh, I think this is normal. I think I've probably done quite well and been quite lucky. Um, I, this is all very historical. I don't know what the, the rates are now, but I think three or four rejections for every one success seems to be, I think that's probably quite good. I, I don't know. Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not trying to show off. Um, <laughs> I did, uh, I did, I asked Nottingham to, uh, extend my career last year uh, and they said no <laughs> so I started applying for other jobs and I'm pleased to say in <laughs> um, so uh, it, it was it's bittersweet giving this little talk um, but uh, yeah they, they said no so um, I look for a second opinion and I'll be going somewhere else but I, I <laughs> applied for four I think four jobs and I, I'm moving soon so um, I think this is normal in academia. I've spoken to a lot of people who've, who've been here, um, and I'm lucky, or, or uh, I'm different. I don't have family commitments as such. I can just move, um, but a lot of people can't move, and I'm really, I really don't like the way that career pro progression works in academia. It's, it really sucks, <laughs> and I had a lot of um, heartfelt conversations with people about this. I hope. <laughs> I'm way past, way past the uh, despair point. Um, this is pretty quick. Um, reasons for hope. Um, I think we're talking about this stuff a lot more. Um, people probably never used to talk about this stuff, failure and um, social media and all those things. The internet, I think, makes that possible. Um, I, I think all these, these problems have always been there, um, but uh, how would we hear about the experiences of the lonely postdoc in South Africa? 30 years ago, we just wouldn't, we wouldn't hear about it. Um, the internet makes all this possible. I don't think the motivations have changed much at all, but um, this thing called open science that um, Brian Nosek and others have championed, very much an early career thing. Old professors tend not to want <laughs> to uh, open up, but who knows why. Um, it's about making your data, your protocols, your methods, 
your work completely open and transparent and available to anyone in the world. And uh, that's a bit scary when you first start it, but eventually it changes the way you work. And I, it's a wonderful thing. And I think this is why all of the failure stuff is going to get better, maybe. And then democratization. I think um, you can just go online and criticize the most senior professor in the world. You can, if you want. <laughs> you, go to, you can go to Twitter later and you know trash my career. And that's absolutely your right. And as long as it's not libelous, you know, good for you. Um, all these platforms, the internet, the availability of information, it all makes this possible and it allows you know, little people um, to, to criticise big people or to collaborate with them. And I think, I think things are much more equal than, than this sort of hierarchical structure that, that maybe academia has been in the past or continues to be. So I think that's a big reason for hope that actually you can all make, you can make, you can publish your work, maybe not in the traditional journals, maybe not in nature or science, but you can do a blog, a podcast, a tweet. You can criticise anyone or support them, of course. <laughs> so, uh, just the last four things are to give me some reading. I've actually read all of these, unlike with everything else that preceded. I've read all of these. Um, my favourite works that uh, help you help you reach the conclusions that I've reached over the years. Um, anyone read this one? Yeah, it's just fantastic. Um, it's a it's a cultural sociological book. Um, by Kuhn, and he's the guy who invented the, the term paradigm shift. So if you've not heard of paradigm, have you heard of paradigm shift? Okay, I've seen it in grant grant funding. That we're looking to propose some paradigm. We want you to do a paradigm shift in this area. You want a step change. And if you've if you've read this book, you would never say that. <laughs> um, and the, the one this is my just my summary. Um, research is very much a cultural activity. Of, you know, individuals sharing ideas. It's not linear progress. You won't just progress towards the truth. Uh, these are circular and backwards, and some things will just stop, and you'll just stop asking that question. Like we don't ask, why is something alive anymore? We just don't ask it. The question's still relevant, but we don't know. We don't ask it. Um, revolutions, scientific revolutions, and paradigm shifts—you won't notice them when they're happening. They're very much a retrospective thing. You sort of look back and think, oh, we're not we're not asking that question anymore. We're actually doing something very different. And someone else, a historian, will come along and say, oh, you've gone through a paradigm shift. You won't notice it. That's one of the takeaways that I took. And almost all research is just absolutely normal and sort of incremental. And people saying we want you to do a paradigm shift in your in your first <laughs> in your first grant, they they need to read this book. Um, this is very much for psychology. If you're doing research with humans or if you are a human yourself, then um, if these are very short books, by the way. Um, Kuhn, probably a day, uh, Barber, maybe a couple of hours. Um, it's fantastic. It talks about the mistakes that people make when they do research, like um, confirmation bias, all the errors they, they, you know, selecting data, removing outliers they don't like, that sort of stuff. Um, all these problems are very old. Humans are very error prone, and humans do science, therefore science is very error prone. I don't think those things are. Uh, is that a syllogy? Is it some sort of logical thing? I don't think that's controversial. Uh, but this book, very short. Um, helps you to identify the errors. Um, and I'm giving links to A, the books, because that's like a fantastic alternative to Amazon that links up um, independent bookstores. And they're all second hand. Um, <clears throat> so that's good for that book. Um, Medawar, I was reading, I'm, I'm rereading this one. I've only got halfway through for this talk. Um, this is a medical uh, researcher who's got a Nobel Prize and he write, writes quite um, very nicely about the what you should you do as a young scientist. <clears throat> And the, the things that I picked from this, you should work on important topics, not just sort of high impact or interesting or high profile ones. Work on something you think is important, and that's not everything. If your favourite hypothesis is falsified, you need to give it up. And um, that's just normal, that's normal science. Um, uh, and then treat other people with respect, when you're, especially when you're criticising them. And um, be curious and critical. So he's got lots of little advice. Again, really short book and a couple of hours reading. My latest one is not from the 1960s and 70s. It's uh, Stuart Ritchie's Science Fictions. This is fantastic. Um, this is inspired by psychology and social psychology and the replication crisis that they've gone through. Um, it's more of a replication awareness, I would say. I think replication failures have always happened. 
but because of the availability of the information, we now all know about it. Um, and he's um, says basically that science is the best way we have of finding out stuff about the world. Um, but the incentives of the system, the impact factors and the peer reviews and the cultural networks that we have, that, um, they basically reinforce bad behaviour. So science can be biased and negligent and even fraudulent, and there's some wonderful cases of science fraud in this slightly larger book. So you just need to be aware of those problems and work against them. So now I uh, leave you to criticise me. Thank you very much. <laughs>